to tell each other our stories. We need to show that everyone, our neighbors, our families, our community leaders, everyone we know is touched by corruption. Good evening and welcome. This is Face the Nation. Our topic of discussion today is anti-corruption and the need for systemic change in Sri Lanka. Joining us this evening on the show are Lassil De Silva, former Director at Administration Sri Lankan Parliament as well as a former Secretary of Presifac. Also joining us this evening on the show is Dhananath Fernando, CEO of Advocata Institute, Dr. Parkis Sudhisaravamuthu, Executive Director of the Centre for Policy Alternatives as well as Sankita Gunratna, Attorney at Law, Deputy Executive Director of Transparency International Sri Lanka to pose questions from our panellists tonight. On my middle right is Nirish Lethambi, Consultant Director at News First as well as Nabi Majid who is a freelance journalist. You too can join in as far as the conversation is concerned. The number to WhatsApp your messages is not 76-656-5353. The number once again, not 76-656-5353. So let's get the ball rolling today with Lassil De Silva, former Director of Administration Parliament, as well as former Secretary of Presifac, which is the Presidential Commission of inquiry to investigate and inquire into serious acts of fraud, corruption and abuse of power, state resources and privileges. Such a long name and nothing has been done so far. On the 18th, on the 3rd of uh, June 2018, a report was submitted to President Maitri Palasi Sena as well. We are talking about corruption. You were the former secretary of this organization. What has been done? Absolutely nothing. The time starts now. Yeah, actually in 2015, let me start that way. It was a mandate given to the then government, headed by uh, Maitri Parasirisena, the then president. I'm happy I was appointed secretary and uh, within a very short period, we did everything what was possible. And uh, there was a generally an accepted, uh, you know, people thought only sprats will be caught, not the sharks. In our case, it was the first commission. Uh, actually, I would say we were very proud because initially. Proud of what? Proud of, proud of what we have been doing. Mm. And for the first time, you know the previous the president Mahindra Rajapaksha and quite a large number of cabinet ministers because there were serious allegations and all of them were brought in and the in investigations were going on we had to do our duty because that was a mandate given to the people by, by the people and as a committed i mean government servant i was also there and there was a, an excellent members of the commission all of us did our job. You ask me what happened and nothing done. True. I know quite a lot of money was spent, but I would like to say we had done our part. I think it may be also pertinent to say that there was pressure to change the course of action, but I never wanted to change. I mean, are you a lawyer? No, no, I'm not a lawyer, actually. So you must be well aware that until proven guilty, everyone in the eyes of the law is innocent. So you're mentioning names of Mahindra Rajapaksa. No, no, no. no I, said, I, said, I said there were allegations against them, right? When there were allegations, it was our duty. That was the terms of reference given to us. And uh, I don't accuse in that way, but... There yeah. can be allegations to Mr. Dissin. No, no, that is why a commission was appointed for. So what did the commission do? We did our part and the investigations were going on. Finally, I was thrown out. Mm. Probably because they were under the impression that end of the day, they will be whatever uh, sent to, you know, the pro uh, due process will be followed and ultimately they'll end up in... Tell me a few cases that you were investigating at that time. Uh, that Mahindra Rajapaksa, there were uh, these allegations against, you know, 
expenses with regard to ITN. They had uh, p p advertised all that for the elections and the bills were not paid. Then the former president Gota Bears, what is this, uh, this security, whatever, they have been used for campaign purposes and all that. And Sri Lankan Airlines, quite a number, you know. So people are leveling an allegation at committees of this nature as well, Mr. De Silva, why? Because they say that if you all did your job right in 2015 when you all got a mandate to have a good governance structure in the country, none of this would have happened. 2019, Gautabi Rajapaksa wouldn't have been able to contest the elections. Uh, there wouldn't be economic mismanagement. Everything would have been okay as far as the country is concerned. But look at what happened. You're, you're right. talking about you're talking about right. anti-corruption. You're talking about big words. All these are buzzwords. We've heard this enough. True, I but agree. What, I agree. Even in Absolutely. even in my Absolutely. case, I endorse all what you say. The problem is if the politicians don't have the political will, what can the public officers do? Right? I mean, this is a long story. We might even have to take up another day. Unless you do the state reforms. You will never be able to public servants. Right. Are, my, my, let me my, my, say this. I want to say this. Now, Abraham Lincoln had, had said, a government of the people, by the people, for the people. I would say, this must go on record. Government of the politicians, by the politicians, for the politicians. So that's the difference, you know. So, Mr. Sir, one final question before I move to um, Dhananath. Uh, you speak about uh, the will of the people, will of politicians, all that and more. But I don't know whether you remember 2019 when you all fielded a presidential candidate, Mahir Sarnag. He was not even able to get 50,000 votes That's not his at, fault. The, at, the, at the presidential That's, election. That, that was not his so fault. Do you think the people want change at this point of time? Because they didn't want change in 2019, that's for sure. They wanted they a change. Want, they they want, wanted a change. Do they want a change now? They wanted a change in 2019, 50, as, as I felt. Yeah. 50,000 votes, they wanted no, no, a change. No, 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 no. People wanted, you're referring to people. Yeah. People wanted a change. And probably they got the change. And they experienced what the change was. We were talking about something more, something better. So you think Gotabi Rajapaksa, who had allegations against him, would have been able to stay the country in 2019? I did say that he was he able. To, no, no, no. Mm. I mean, people wanted Gotabe, mm. right? People elected him. Mm. Uh, it start within our control, you know. Right. <coughs> Thank you very much, um, Lesel De Silva, former director, of administration, parliament, as well as the former secretary of uh, Presifac. I now move my attention towards Dhananath Fernando, CEO of Advocata Institute. Dhananath, we're talking about corruption over and over again. I remember you coming on the show and saying, we have to put a stop for corruption if the country is to develop. Why are we still talking about corruption? I think the question is twofold, Shamir. Of course, nothing has happened. Mm. But when we look at the overall system, I see there are two elements. One is the people's element. The second thing is the system element. We are looking at people appointing honest people who can basically carry out those mandate and basically put people who are corrupted behind the bars, that's one side. But also to get the people who can put the corrupt people behind the bars, that process is also need to be strengthened. So it's, it, it has to go hand in hand. And unfortunately, in, in, in my view, corruption in certain cases is a is a byproduct or like it's an output of a massive policy issue on the other side for an example uh, if you get the sugar scam even if you go to courts i do not think that you can be proven that it was a scam we all know it's a scam because it was done in the legal given the mandate to the minister of trade because he can basically change the tariff overnight he can bring it down overnight based on his discretion so when you have that sort of a room uh, in the legal system it's very difficult to corner someone because in a way that corruption is institutionalized so that's a system issue but now the question is how are we going going to bring someone who can change that system 
because we all know that incentivizes the politicians and their campaigns and all that. I think now it has the time has come that we should ask ourselves what can we all know the politician the political will could have done it but we all know the politicians do not have the will to do it. Mm -hmm. So then we have to ask the question what we should do to get the will or if without their will how can we do it within the legal framework. Mm -hmm. I think that's the question so in, in that sense I see that's where I think the civil society organizations journalists has to come together and set that framework also to bring the correct people into power and also once they are in power also get that system that can mandate that uh, getting the right people in. So, so Dharana, right after the IMF came to Sri Lanka's rescue, uh, they brought in uh, a framework which needed to be adhered to. And one of the frameworks really capitalized on making sure that there was no corruption in the country. But look at what the revelations that were being made recently, even in parliament, uh, uh, parliamentarian party, Champik Ranoka went on to say that billions of rupees have been uh, swindled from uh, the people's essentials. We saw the health crisis that took place in the country. Then you mentioned about the sugar scam and all that and more. So things are happening even now. Can that be stomached by the people? Because we're talking about this year being an election year as well. How important is that for the public and also for the IMF? To look at moving forward? Definitely not. Even when the IMF representative met the civil society organizations, that was one request. Because IMF at this moment have a lever uh, with the government because that tranche or that money is required to continuation of the debt restructuring. Mm -hmm. So whether that uh, implementation of the IMF governance re report uh, uh, recommendations and also the civil society has done another extensive report. So whether that can be made in a way sort of a condition conditionality to get that uh, you know to proceed with the IMF agreement. So definitely the people cannot uh, digest uh, this level of corruption mm -hmm. but the challenge is again it's I think institutionalized. And it has been institutionalized for a reason uh, that is to benefit the benefit we all know the obvious culprits. But I think what we need to fight for is basically to change to to change that system element as well as that people element together. And I think without that, uh, we will be speaking the same problem. So, in, so Dharana, in years uh, time. very quickly, I'm going to ask you a few um, open-ended questions. I need a yes or a no to uh, uh, to before I move to Dr. Sara, um, Are you satisfied with the country's economy? No. Is Ranil Vikramasinghe going to be the next president of the country who can make that change as far as the country is concerned? I would like to skip that question. I mean, uh, but I can, I, yes, I, I don't have a yes, yes or no answer. Yes or no would be <laughs> ideal. Uh, <laughs> No, I think it's it's the, it's a program. I, I, I as I mentioned, there's a people's element and a system element. I more would like to look at the the process and the system. The reforms hasn't Prem, been done. So, so is Sajid Premadas a, a good option for the country? I think the program, whoever the leader, the program is what matters because without the state-owned enterprises reforms, without those anti-corruption laws, whoever who comes, the name Brand doesn't Brand matter. Sanak is not the option. The name doesn't matter. The action is. What is, what, what is going to matter, Shamir? Thank you very much, uh, Dhananath Fernando, CEO of Adukara Institute. I now move my attention towards Dr. Parke Sosaranamuthu, Executive Director of the Centre for Policy Alternatives. Dr. Sara, Dhananath also went on to say the importance of the civil society at this point of time. How do you view the role of the civil society in an election year and also when you're talking about corruption? Well. <coughs> As I've said many times, and I think on this show as well, I think the role of civil society is setting the agenda. <laughs> civil society is not there to grab political power. What civil society is there to do is to set the agenda of reform. And I think that's what civil society needs to concentrate on, both in terms of constitutional reforms, in terms of economic reforms, the governance reforms, all of that. And I think what we need to do is to get our act together fast because Perhaps we don't have enough time in terms of the impending presidential election, for example, to come up with a list of reforms, in effect, a civil society manifesto, which we should get the political parties to subscribe to. Mm -hmm. 
subscribe to in whole and if they can't, in part. But I think they should subscribe to it in whole and commit themselves <clears throat> to implementing those reforms. Once they get into power, we have to continue to be vigilant to ensure that they do implement those reforms. But I would like to say some, one other thing. I mean, you know, politicians are not a different breed. They come from society. They don't fall from the skies or crawl up from under a stone. They're us. And we have to recognize our responsibility in terms of the crisis that we have. And with regard to corruption, for example, there is a, a long, prolonged debate, an unresolved one. Is it institutions or is it political culture? And what are the dynamics between the two? You know, is it political culture in terms of what the people want and how they, what they expect and their attitudes? Or is it making laws, good laws, which then the political culture has to take on and implement? And I think that is a major problem that we have in terms of the implementation. Mm -hmm. And one last thing as well. You know, politicians, yes, in Sri Lanka, we all recognize them to be corrupt. However, going after them, we have to recognize that our social contract is in complete shambles and we cannot go after them without observing the rule of law. So we have to have evidence that will stand up in court to prosecute and convict them. I think that's very important. There are allegations all over. You and I might think that X and Y is corrupt, but we don't have the hard evidence. But if the state is going to do this, it needs to have that hard evidence. The rule of law needs to be observed. Mm. And one other point just outside of that, you know, politicians, particularly members of parliament, we also need to look at what they spend their money on and as to whether they are given a salary that is appropriate to the demands of their electorates. Mm -hmm. Because after all, at the end of the day, every birth, every wedding, every funeral, they're expected to pay, either in whole or in part. Mm -hmm. Where do they get that money from? And the very last one, talking about civil society and corruption, you know, I always think of this as the best example. We have a public education system which has a two and a half mile limit in terms of admission to those schools. Every parent wants to send their child to the best ones because it's the public school system, all schools are not equal. Instead of naming the schools, I think you'll know which ones they are. How many of them actually live within that two and a half mile limit? Mm -hmm. And if you think of other schools located elsewhere in the city of Colombo, if the two and a half mile limit was there, they would be very different. Very different. Uh, Dr. Sarah, you said about setting the agenda and you said that's the role of the civil society. But during the Aragal era in 2022, we saw the people setting the agenda for the country. They want a systemic change. Do you see that systemic change happening in the country or at least unfolding gradually step by step coming to an election year? I think the Aragal era achieved one thing. That was to get the Rajapaksas out of government. With regard to this whole system change thing, I've had one in 101 different versions of what the system change was supposed to be. For example, I was told that at night in the Aragale, in Golfest, there used to be terrific debates whether one should abolish the executive presidency. And some even came to blows. Now, what I'm trying to say to you is this, the Aragale was flat. It didn't have one single leadership. Therefore, it didn't have a single program. It could only talk about it in slogans. And so system change has become a buzzword. Ask people what they want, mean by system change. Ask them and you'll find 101 different versions. So you have to, if you are doing this, okay, the Aragalia was probably spontaneous. But if you are really talking about an agenda or a reform, you need to think about it and get a consensus with regard to what it is and come out with it 
in generalities, but also some specifics as well. Uh, Dr. very quickly, uh, before I move on to Sankita, you said that the people wanted the Rajapaksas out of the governance structure, but we've seen now uh, Basil Rajapaksa is back in a saddle. Out of government. Out of not government. governance. Okay. Out so, of government. So now people have re people rejected the Rajapaksas at one point. During the Aragale, we saw that unfolding. Uh, they, there were slogans against the Rajapaksas, but now it seems that the people themselves have forgotten Nama Rajapaksa. He's a national organizer of the Sri Lanka Pujana Pyramid. He was appointed recently. What is happening? Well, are, are we going to witness something like in the Philippines again? Well, let's hope not. Let's hope not. And let's hope that those people who are allegedly guilty of uh, pilfering the public coffers are caught, indicted and prosecuted. But the problem here is this. <coughs> yes, Namal Rajapaksa is around and he may well become president in 10 years time or whatever it is. But the question... So you're saying he, that he may be the president of the country? He could what? become the president of this country 10 years from now. I'm not giving a prediction here. I'm not Nostradamus. But it could happen, as it happened with Bong Bong. No, but the, the issue here is that the people have to be vigilant. They can't, you know, do something and then forget about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, with regard to the Aragalia, what happened? The middle class deserted the Aragalia. A large number of members who went and protested and spent time in the Aragale at Golfes are now either abroad or trying to find ways of getting a visa or trying to find ways of getting a job to go abroad. Mm -hmm. So the whole narrative with regard to the Aragale was allowed to be changed by the new government. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Pakistan Ramutu, Executive Director of the Center for Policy Alternatives. Uh, I now move my attention towards uh, Sankita Gunratna, Deputy Executive Director of Transparency International Sri Lanka. Uh, Sankita, Dr. Sarah spoke about the role of the civil society. What do you think the role of the people should be, the public should be, at a time we're talking about an election, we're still talking about corruption, we're back to square one again, unfortunately. What's the role of the public? I think the most important critical issue right now is about voting right and rejecting people that you find to be unfit. That means looking at asset declarations of candidates. That means uh, rejecting people who have criminal records or allegations of criminality, allegations of abuse of public resources, who spend their campaign finances on vote buying, who uh, basically abuse power uh, to thieve their way into power. So it, uh, the, the importance of the vote, especially at this election year, cannot be understated. Because if you look at the culmination of the entire Aragale, yes, uh, certain, uh, the Rajapakshas were um, thrown out of government unceremoniously, but we ostensibly have the same government in place, mm. right? So if we ever get to a point of elections, and, and we are at a point when we are struggling to even have elections, where elections are illegally and indefinitely postponed. So if an election is so hard fought, and we managed to get to the point of polls, I think we should appreciate the value of it a lot more than we have. We've taken it for granted over the years. Um, so why we should also think about why the elections are being postponed uh, so desperately. That is because the power of the elections are felt by those in power right now. Because there was a tidal wave of protests that was unprecedented. So. The politicians are taking the power of the people seriously enough to postpone elections for us to be under the threat that elections, presidential elections might constitu unconstitutionally not happen, that uh, the parliamentary elections may not happen. That means to that extent, those in power are clinging on to power because there's no guarantee that they'll be re-elected. Are you trying to say that elections will not be held this year? Again, I'm not Nostradamus either, but there is the risk of that. If you look at precedent that's already been set, the local government elections have been illeg illegally and indefinitely postponed. That is fact. So I don't have to predict this. There, there is certainly a possibility that this will illegally happen. 
So then the question is, if such a desperate attempt has been already made mm -hmm. to delay elections, that in itself would tell you what the power of the vote is. So I think the most important mm -hmm. thing for the people to keep in mind is to re reject bad politicians and do your part. So you need to... I mean, we, all of us as, as citizens, and I'm not by any chance, a, a, any, in any sense, preaching here, we all need to recognize uh, what the, uh, the legitimate mandate of a politician is, as so Dr. Sarah was saying. I, I, want to go back, I want to go back to uh, the year 2020, uh, Sankita, uh, the, uh, the parliamentary elections. Uh, if you look at it, the UNP was rejected by the people. They were considered as bad politicians. None of the members were elected by the people. They had one seat. That seat, fortunately or unfortunately, was occupied by Ranil Vikram Singh, who is now the president. However, at least the people in Colombo and the urban areas are of the view that the president is doing a good job. There are no long queues anymore. There is, uh, there is no long 13-hour power cuts in the country. Everything is hunky-dory. The dollar is coming down. All this is I in the right direction. I think we should be careful about treating the people of Colombo as a monolith. Uh, again, going back to the original point I was saying, there may be a few people very loudly saying that what the president is doing is right. That does not mean that the majority feel that way and the only way we can so find, find that in out event, in the event yes. there is an election he may lose he may lose he may win we don't know but what is crucial is that we put that to the test going back to the point of election so to your question of what should the people do so uh, when people want the system to change in 2022 from the Aragalaya, do you think the present government has been able to give them that I don't think so. I don't think so because what the people wanted was a, a change in systems. So, what change in systems are we seeing? But what uh, what, uh, you're, what uh, they were calling but for? But I back to square one, uh, Sankita. But we spoke about corruption in 2015. I remember individuals in the caliber of Dr. Sarah were advocating for good governance. People in the caliber of uh, uh, Lassil de Silva spoke about good governance. Look at where we are today. I We're absolutely still agree with about you. corruption eight years down the line. I absolutely agree with you, but we should also keep in mind that change, and this is in no way meant to be a defense of the current government or the 2015 government or any government, but change also takes place incrementally. So it is important for civil society and for people, especially in this kind of state where uh, we don't have many options where domestic remedies seem to be failing to not lose hope and to keep pushing for that change and keep doing your part at elections between elections as you as an active citizen to push towards that change. So certainly we don't have an ideal situation. We have a desperate situation which makes our role all the more important. Very unfortunate Sankita, very unfortunate that we are in this situation again and we're talking about uh talking about good governance and the need for creating an anti-corruption free country, you know. Very unfortunate. Uh, so I open the floor for questions from our journalists. On the mid right is um, Nirish Ali Thambi and on the mid left is uh, Nadeem Majid. Uh, Nadeem, yeah. shall we switch to uh, Nirish and uh, let's get the ball rolling with Nirish today. Thank you, Shamir. Um, a very wise man once told me if you want to root out corruption, follow the money. Now, uh, there's a lot of talk about corruption, about laws, about system change, but there doesn't seem to be a lot of following the money. So, um, Sankita, let me put this rather simple question to you. We're talking about billions, if not trillions, which have been looted. Nobody knows how much. Where is this money going? Is it in Sri Lanka? Is it going overseas? How is it getting there? Uh, do politicians sort of carry gunny bags of money across uh, Bandaranaike International Airport and are not stopped uh, and land somewhere else and they're let in? Or is it going through the banking system? Um, how does this happen? 
So over time, um, wait, let me start with uh, 2017. In 2017, there was something called the Global Forum on Asset Recovery, hosted by the US and the UK governments, where they brought together countries where assets that have gone from Sri Lanka and a few other countries have ended up and they brought together those authorities with the authorities of Sri Lanka. At the end of that conference, so what the, the purpose of the conference was for those authorities to discuss this kind of asset flight cases of following the money to literally to do what you wanted uh, us to discuss to follow the money in rooms through bilateral and trilateral or multilateral meetings. So at the end of that, uh, then um, Attorney General announced that 43 cases, asset recovery cases, had been discussed during just that conference of less than five days. But by now, we don't have an inkling of what happened to those cases. I'm told that about 11 of those cases went to the stage of even requesting formal mutual legal assistance from those destination countries, whichever the countries were. But we have no idea why uh, progress on these cases stalled. But what we can see is that it has certainly stalled. There is no public record of what these cases were. And when you look at the Aragale and the call of the people for asset recovery, that's literally what was happening at that point of time. But nothing has moved. So for asset recovery to happen, there has to be political will. To your question of how is money leaving the country, it is through the banking system where private banks, state banks <coughs> fail to report suspicious transactions. It is literally also through these gunny bags. Uh, we are told that it even happens through the diplomatic service sometimes, where they have a level of uh, you know, uh, impunity when being checked at airports. So this kind of thing happens in, uh, through enable, enablers. If you look at the Pandora Papers, the Paradise Papers, the leaks happened through financial advisors, persons who should be actually the guardians of the system, turning the op in the opposite direction and providing financial advisory services, audit advisory, tax advisory, legal advisory services to the corrupt people in the, of the world so that they can arrange their affairs to avoid regulatory systems. So that is how money gets stolen. So Dharanath, uh, we're speaking about the Stolen Asset Recovery Initiative uh, which is in partnership between the World Bank Group and the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime uh, that supports international efforts to end safe havens for corrupt funds. Why aren't we able to tap the STAR program of the World Bank to bring those money back which has been stolen? We have, I think, to an extent made an attempt. In, at least it, it is as a recommendation on the IMF governance report. What Sankita exactly mentioned, still in our system, it is very difficult to detect some of the suspicion transactions. So that's why if you look at that IMF governance diagnosis report, that anti-corruption and money laundering uh, has given a separate section. Uh, so that's, that's important. But unfortunately, if you recall, we were also in the grey list for a long time. Uh, under this anti-corruption and money laundering uh, or like the, I think the if I remember right, FAT, FATF, uh, FATF, the FATF, Financial FATF, Action Task Force. Uh, FATF. And then, of course, bec that's why I said if there's also a policy element, if you recall, during that time, at the height of the crisis, the government said at that point, because we had a forex shortage, that no questions asked, you can bring your money and deposit in banks if you even have dollars. And at that point, there was that risk that we were about to go back to that grey list uh, because of the bad... even blacklist. Exactly. But then the problem is even with the, star pro the stolen asset recovery program, right? Even bodies like the OECD have acknowledged that this hasn't been broadly successful. Uh, that of the estimated <coughs> 20 to 40 billion dollars that are stolen from developing countries annually, uh, I think the figure was between 2010 and 15, if I'm not mistaken, the total that countries had managed to recover was about $150 million or something. This is out of 20 to 40 billion estimated to have been <laughs> stolen from different countries, right? So even when the IMF makes these recommendations, like, uh, oh, you should uh, join up with STAR, doesn't that sound like lip service? In a because way, does it actually, do you actually end up achieving no, anything? Because no. you're allocating resources now, right? So you're going to spend on mm. the commissions of inquiry or on the AG's department to pay people salaries, to work with uh, staff, 
to get money and then there's a very real potential that you get nothing back now to a, to an extent nadim i agree it is uh, it is just as a recommendation and i'm sure there are multiple recommendations that has come in various reports and we all know that um, and and that's where i think coming back to that question the importance of c- civil society and that's why we need to push those reforms and get it done and we all know the the delays in the judiciary system and the and the loopholes in the legal system is basically not even if we really want to bring down those assets uh it is very difficult given the current legal Without system any serious will do absolutely and also yes uh so sankita i was going to ask this question from lasil but as the anti corruption watchdog i'm going to ask you this question do you feel that you know whenever we speak of ac- incidents of corruption especially acts of grand corruption whether the bond scam or uh the cases that pressifac was looking into the go to response by the executive and sometimes even by parliament is either to have a select committee or presidential commission of inquiry do you feel that regardless of what the stated intention is do you feel that the intended purpose of these commissions and select committees at the end of the day is obfuscation i think you have a very good say, case to say so because if the authorities that are already in place were empowered were given the level of independence required to carry out their duties you don't need to reinvent the wheel you don't need to set up additional mechanisms that uh, don't have the power of law enforcement to do that having said that we have seen that where law enforcement has failed continuously these commissions in certain instances uh, political the political victimization commission being an ex- uh, a notable exception but there are notable exceptions to this also uh, some of these commissions the commissions of inquiry on uh, disappearances pressifac they they also have served a purpose of documenting incidents of corruption and that in in the backdrop of the failure of accountability frameworks of the existing <coughs> law enforcement frameworks that does have some value because it documents incidents for posterity and uh, if if i recall correctly in 20 so at, i believe you look at all of the the series of commissions that we've had over the i mean even just the past decade or decade and a half this uh, we can build our own sort of separate archive the corruption Absolutely. in sri lanka this there doesn't seem to be any action taken on it presifac had 34 cases if i'm not mistaken 37 or something okay 37 yeah. cases and i think one of your recommendations was to strip mahindra rajapaksa of civic no, rights no actually yeah one and uh, to take a decision if there were corrupt politicians you know in general to take a decision by parliament so that they'll there'll be certain controls you know restrictions for them to get <coughs> involved in politics again So so uh, what 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 I so same thing I asked when you 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 were uh, uh, you were paid by the presidential secretary yeah. to be the secretary to this commission do you feel that you wasted public money because you are invested the all of the work that you've done the millions of rupees for the uh, i think 3 3 4 years that your commission was in operation so let me let me, let was, me add was that, that was that was yeah. was that was there any benefit was there a net benefit to the public so, out so, that, so outside nothing, of nothing, having nothing, a yeah. like, so there's a view also asking a very similar question are all these so called commissions are a waste of taxpayers money at the naturally end. up to now most of these commissions because i was thrown out in that way and if we were allowed to continue and finally after having submitted the reports because our duty was to do the investigation the report was submitted on the 3rd of june 2018 uh, january so uh, january yeah. naturally we that most of these commission look at uh, even is sunday most of these commissions they have made wonderful recommendations but the problem is no action taken thereafter that is not the fault of the public office so where is the problem because you look the no, the now I, president I, then, then, then prime minister ranil wickremesinghe said so, that specifically one of the most yeah, serious yeah, issues yeah that's no, a very no, good no, problem no, now no, see sankita used the word yeah. stall yeah, yeah. now But sankita uh, how will stall this is in, in the case of an investigation it doesn't stall yeah. it is deliberately not mm. even stall is thrown into the waste paper basket thrown into the waste paper basket yeah. now so i like who, to add, who has I the like power to, to do that this is it i like to add one uh, you know my comments on what you raised from sangeeta now see there was 
this discussion about this money going out, right? Remember, in, in 1953, we had an Exchange Control Act, which was very, very strong. In 2017, if I remember right, 7 of 2017, right? I mean, permitted all kinds of transactions. You could send money freely, all that, right? And Vijaydasa Rajapaksha, Justice Minister himself, on the floor of the house, if I remember right, and it was published in papers or uh, Island or something like that, Karid, it said, we, we also supported that. And there were about 56 billion uh, rupees parked overseas. And they will take action to take uh, bring, bring the money back. Up to now, they have not done anything. So, now look at China, such so, a strong country. Uh, Mr. Rasen, let me ask this question. Okay, so there are these figures, right? Global estimate is 20 to 40 billion dollars is being stolen from developing countries annually. Uh, you're saying that in Sri Lanka's case, there's about 56 billion rupees that has been parked overseas somewhere. Who is responsible? Who is where does the buck stop here? Is it the political authorities or law enforcement? You know, I like to Should say we be the, I going like and protesting say, outside the Attorney General's I, I, I like to say it this way. Now, up to 70s, there was no such problems. Right? If there was any indiscipline or whatever, people would have been dealt with, especially public officers. And even with regard to politicians, it was somewhat okay. Now, after 70s, I would say after 78, the president is about the law, right? It is the president who runs the entire show, I would say it that way. It is the president who runs the entire show. Go to parliament, you can see what's happening in parliament, right? The speaker is supposed to be some, somebody like a, just, a judge, but what happens? So basically, by your assessment, the buck stopped with J.R. Jayawardena, we can't hold him accountable anymore, but he basically brought this on all of us. Correct, yes. Now, let the robber barons come. Huh? Yeah. Let the robber barons come. But I mean, <laughs> there are, the, like, incidents of abuse of power have been happening. There's a, a famous case against a, uh, who was not even a minister at the time, involving uh, a case of throwing acid, where a prime minister who would later go on to be stripped of her civic rights, intervened to have this young uh, UNP-affiliated lawyer acquitted. Mm. Uh, so we know that abuse of power, instances of abuse of power in Sri Lanka are not restricted to post-78. They have been happening pre, well, since 1948. Yeah, it has happened, but not to this extent, you know, because even in 1970, there were incidents like even in Jaffna, you know, I mean, no action taken. I agree. To a great extent, there were shortcomings even then. But the parliament, for all purposes, is responsible, in my view, because, you know, they should be able to enact the kind of laws that are needed here to resolve these issues. So it's not happening. Now, go back again. With the 78th constitution, what happened? There was a monster created. The president takes care of the whole thing. And it is the president, ultimately, who decides uh, what should be done in the country. So, for all purposes in this country, all what I personally think is this, right? This system was changed in 1970s, having replaced a constitution where the rule of law is a mm. thing not... You know, say, yeah, I get where you're going with this, Ms. Lassell, but I just want to ask Dr. Saranuthu as well. Uh, Dr. Sarah, you worked, you've done, worked on uh, consultation, you were part of the consultation uh, team for the, for constitutional reforms. Uh, or you led, or you were no, I was going public consultation. That was on transitional justice. Sorry, on transitional justice. But yes, I was involved in constitutional With constitutional reforms as well, you've been involved. So let do you, f how effective a measure do you do you see constitutional reforms? As last I was talking about constitutional reform to fight corruption. Uh, can we fight corruption through constitutional reforms? No, not by it alone. But I think it is necessary, but not sufficient. As I said to you before, you have the institutions and the laws on one side, and you have the public and their culture on the other. And the problem that we are facing here is is that we have laws, they're not properly implemented. Mm. Why? because the people who are supposed to be implementing them are either politicized, partisan, corrupt. 
yeah. you have to change that. So, where, and so, so on the has, accountability question, is it, do we, like I, I asked, I mean, we were, pro uh, pe the people at the Argale were protesting outside the, the symbols of political power, right? The parliament, the presidential secretariat. Um, and what I'm asking is, in, with regards to fighting corruption, should those protests be happening outside the symbols of bureaucratic power? Like the AG's department, the police headquarters. Well, I mean, all of those. Are, all of them are symbols of democratic power. Parliament, the president's office, the prime minister's office, the AG's department, all of that. If you're going to have an attorney general, for example, who defends the government and is also the chief prosecutor, it's an open conflict of interest. Mm. That has to change. Those changes can only come if the overarching law of the land creates a framework which allows for transparency and accountability and all the other things with regard to national reconciliation as well. You know, but just one point that I would, I mean, I, it, it, it's in a sense a question to Mr. Tulasa. You know, I don't think the Argale would have happened if not for social media. Mm. Yeah, the success of the Argale, I think, is largely because of social media. When you all came up with recommendations that, like, Mahindra Rajpaksa should be stripped of his civic rights, etc., did you all have uh, a website? Did you all put this up there? Did you tell the general public of Sri Lanka no, that these are your recommendations? Our duty was to recommend it to the president because uh -huh. we have to submit the report there, right? So on that basis, hmm? we have done that. I mean, reported to the president. Unfortunately, nothing has happened. Oh, but the, so the, the Prime Minister announced, uh, Prime Minister Rani Vik, then Prime Minister Rani Vikram Singh announced it at an election rally. But I think rally. that's the thing. <laughs> that 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 in the future, if we have any commissions, they must be allowed to have that conversation with the public of Sri Lanka in terms of transparency and accountability, and not just to the President, because as we've said, the President sits on this apex of power. He appoints secretaries to ministries. He has an AG who is totally politicized and a parliament who is effectively a rubber stamp of some sort. So, Dr. Sarah, uh, a question from one of our viewers. Uh, aren't these asset declaration forms just an academic exercise? It may be appropriate in a very developed world where all institutions are connected through technology and a culture of zero tolerance to corruption. But in Sri Lanka, politicians can get the commissions in corrupt jurisdictions in Africa and Asia and channel them to assets in developed countries through shell companies. So, don't you think that asset declaration forms at the end of the day is just an academic exercise? Well, it will not succeed in full, but it may well succeed in part. I was talking to a politician, a higher politician in one of the political parties, and I said, why haven't you come up with your asset declarations? And they said, oh, it's a waste of time, because the asset declarations are meaningless. Because we also know that people have received tons of cash in brown paper bags. And it's been going on ever since 1948. You know, so you're never going to get the full picture. But you will get some part of it. It is incremental progress, unfortunately. It's not going to happen overnight. Uh, Sankar, so, just on that question of, uh, uh, not just on asset declarations, but broadly, uh, TISL along with uh, several other civil society groups was working with the government on uh, the open government partnership uh, starting from 2016 or 17 I believe uh, through to well in minus the gap uh, where Gotabe Rajapaksa was president and then again now you all recently decided to withdraw the civil society coalition withdrew from that program citing the government's the passage of the online safety act and the work that was being done on the counter-terrorism act the grounds, for, do you feel that you have weakened civil society's position in your ability to uh, influence government policy by withdrawing from that program? That's a very good question, Nadim. And these were certainly considerations when that decision was being made. So for our viewers, the Open Government Partnership is a forum where government and civil society uh, commit to working together towards uh, achieving transparency, accountability and public participation in certain prioritized sectors like health or education. And digitization of asset decorations was amongst those commitments that you made? Yes, but the digital, if you're speaking about the digitization of asset decorations, getting that bill passed was part of the 2019 to 2021 uh, 
national action plan of the open government partnership and it's already now law and is supposed to be implemented also but on the larger question that you ask the risk with civil society when we engaged uh, on the open government partnership process we as civil society had a frank conversation even with the officials of the presidential secretariat engaging on this and we made our terms clear that and what was their response the response was positive in the sense that they wanted to engage with goodwill the public officials that engaged engaged quite proactively with the civil society groups there but civil society made its position clear that we are consciously engaging with the state in a context of civic repression so we started engaging at the end of last year november december last year when civic repression was starting off was strong there were conversations about the um, online safety act but it hadn't come to fruition there was still but who did you meet at the presidential happening. secretariat uh, sankita there were additional secretaries administrative officials working with uh, taking the lead there at the presidential but, but they secretary. can't take decisions can they yes so it is at the point when the national action plan was about to receive cabinet approval because we needed to bridge that gap between dealing with public officials to taking into consideration the larger context within which we were operating that we found ourselves unable to proceed because we were still working with a government that was proceeding with civic repression proceeding with uh, the online safety act that was protested to by the people that was proceeding with a counter uh, anti terrorism act version 2 that had gone through various waves of protest uh, that was more draconian <coughs> that was pitched to be more yeah, draconian than no, the no, existing no, no, well, let me let me ask you i'm trying to think of a time in sri lanka where there hasn't been civic repression sorry i'm trying to think of a time in sri lanka where there hasn't been civic well repression. okay it's a question of a difference of degrees or a difference of kind yeah but you know the question about you know who did you engage with at the presidential secretary i mean we have an executive presidency which is all powerful yeah it is particularly powerful at this present moment where all decisions are made in the presidential secretariat and they're made by one person mr anil wickremesinghe the president of sri lanka all those people in that secretariat they don't make decisions we all I know that they carry out orders so if you want anything done you have to go to the president and i suppose there are only 24 hours in a day and he can't see everyone all the time yeah. but all these meetings are um, does not make any sense yeah. well i mean you might day. take take whatever it is to the president <laughs> so, yeah. and if yeah. he has the time you might look so, at so that not uh, um, a question for you cabinet recently approved contracts related to leasing four aircraft to sri lankan airlines at a monthly cost of approximately 725000 us dollars how can this kind of expenditure be justified when the airline hasn't turned a profit for an extended period shouldn't there be downsizing operations until a suitable investor is found absolutely uh, i think this this doesn't make any sense and that's why uh, shamir i'm going to my first initial remarks With that policy element or the system element is paramount important because on state owned enterprises that's a vehicle for corruption and we all know during election times how this finance is being managed because of those state assets rather than running it through the line ministries you are basically it's convenient to run it through uh, state owned enterprises and on corruption those are the vehicles for corruption on your previous point on president uh, the executive presidency that's why the now the challenge is in particular the things are very severe when president is also the minister of finance yeah. because uh, that's why we say it is not regarding this president it across every time From when the time. when the president is the finance minister it's nearly impossible job to do on one side on the other side it opens a lot of room for corruption because you are basically the president you are appointing the central bank governor you are basically appointing most of the senior people and the power is centralized and that is not a workable uh, workable solution and that's why the pres- if, if and also it also uh, dilutes the entire strength of the financial system because we all know when the president is specially willing to run for a second term finance minister's job is a very unpopular job you have to cut down the expenditure you have to increase the revenue i mean both are very unpopular and when you are planning to run for a popular job with that unpopular portfolio in your hand 
it doesn't go well so that's the that's the other challenge and we saw the repercussions of that how things have happened so on SOEs, definitely, I think not only Sri Lankan Airlines, I think there are multiple cases how these things have happened and mainly the procurement at SOEs is another way, channel that of course this corruption takes place. We know the Airbus case, what has happened. Yeah. Uh, so, so, those two elements has to go hand in hand and that's why the, the, the speediness of the judiciary system is very important. I think all those regulations are important, but also the digitization of that legal system is also at the same time important because otherwise we all know what politicians do. They basically skip three hearings and when you do it for like two years, there will be a new government and that opens uh, for, a, for another year. So, uh, uh, another question if you don't mind, uh, uh, Niresh. Uh, the president at a meeting with the BOI today mentioned that approvals for investment will be done by one division. And if there is a delay, the minister has the authority to either approve or disapprove. Won't this lead to severe corruption? Absolutely. The, this is the discretionary power. In anything, when you have the discretionary <coughs> power under one person, that basically le leads for corruption. Mm. I think a classic case is NMRA. I think that's why I say especially we cannot implement some of the first world solutions to this culture and this setup. It doesn't mean that we have to completely uh, wipe out those solutions. But I think on the NMRA, now the former health minister is not actually in jail in the, at the hospital. Mm -hmm. But actually, the, uh, a, a reasonable solution could have been, I think the countries like Singapore and US, they have a process to approve drugs. So, any drug which is approved in Singapore, if it's implemented here, that's the case is done. But now you have set up a separate unit to approve the drugs to Sri Lanka and you know what we know all know what has happened. The data has been deleted and then there's another and then people are smuggling uh, different types of drugs. But it could have been a better solution without setting up that I'm not saying to completely dismantle NMRMA. But when you have a better system in a different country which you can easily replicate here, if that's approved there, it's approved here. So then if you want to really get something and you cannot influence the Singapore system. So I think those solutions is unfortunately what we have to look at now rather than trying to, I mean, it is important that we set up our system, but I think we also have to look at the other options well, at the same you time. You want to yeah, something. actually we had very good systems, you know, say Seneca Bibile. Those principles were ultimately laid down and it was all practiced here and system was functioning so very well. Actually, my problem is, you know, the three pillars of justice, temple of justice, they say, the uh, executive, the judiciary and the legislature, right, should not be undermined. What has really happened here is that, basically, we need to understand that, right. Executive has a role of its own and that should be done independently by them, which they did even with regard to NMRA. That was a computerized system, they did it. Spent some so, Mr. Lassie, you said it should not be undermined. Who has undermined it? No, undermined by the biggest man in the country. The right? executive, basically. No, and, and the cabinet. Why, Why are you see? pointing the finger at Ranil Vikram Singh? No, 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 I'm not, I'm not pointing a finger at Ranil Vikram Singh. I'm, I'm pointing a finger at, about the system. Right? System needs to will be corrected. Will you point the finger at Maitri policy to say now? I will point a system, um, uh, if there's a mistake, no, I will definitely... You are saying executive will have less ill, you have to be practical, no, 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 there no. has to be someone responsible at the end you of the know, day, why are you, now, why are you this not is, answering the no, question? This is why I said that the three pillars we have, right? So it's, when you say executive, President Anil Vikram Singh. Now, now let, let me say this no, first. No, when you say executive, yeah. no, 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 not only not, not only the president. Now the entire public service comes under the president, right? The executive. Ah, right? so ultimately Anil Vikram Singh. Naturally, because he is the head. So the, you can say that. No, sir. Let's see. Why no, no, scared? no, no. I'm not scared. I, 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 I was not. I was never reluctant to say it. I, I, I said specifically the president, right? But I am trying. President Anil Vikram Singh. I mean, it is the He is the president now. Hmm. I'm talking about the presidency from 1970. Ah, whoever the president is, he has to be responsible. In in, in the executive, let, now let me say, say it clearly. Here in this country, we were we we were fully well aware there were three pillars, right? The executive, right, the judiciary, said that. Okay, understood. Uh, legislation, right? right? So these okay. three in institutions has to be has to be given all the independence to work 
out their programs, duties, all that independently, mm. right? Now, what has happened here, the biggest problem, now he says about this NMRA, right? Who is responsible? The minister. Now, minister is in remand custody. There are allegations against them also because whatever said and done, all those decisions were taken by the cabinet and the whole responsibility goes collectively for all of them. We have to understand all that. And the entire cabinet is responsible. When, no, 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 no. Not just and, the health minister. No, 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 the entire no, no, cabinet no. should have been indicted. No, and when, when a cabinet paper is approved by the cabinet of ministers, right, collectively, Article 42 of the Constitution, it has to be the cabinet of ministers, right? So, but, so, so basically what you're saying is this collective responsibility. They, they, they are all responsible, all responsible for all the mistakes, all for all the uh, omissions, you know, whatever inaction or action all that right they are responsible unfortunately it does not now ultimately end up with them because they know how to sort of uh, you know get away from all that so what i am trying to tell you we have to understand how the system was broken down actually now like what he said all the appointments are made by the president article 52 1 says the secretary shall be appointed by the president right when the secretary is appointed by the president, ultimately he has to work under the dictates of the president, right? And the other thing is, 52.2 specifically says that he is under the supervision and instructions of the minister. So this system has eventually broken down the concept of three pillar, you know, system. And uh, having broken it down, what eventually has happened, everybody ultimately interferes with the uh, uh, purchasers, whatever, if ever it is a tender or whatever, right? Now, those days under Article 7, you know, uh, before, before 1970, the permanent secretaries, they took the responsibility, they are directly answerable to Parliament, through the Minister, to the Public Accounts Committee. Right? When they go to the Public Accounts Committee, if they have done a mistake those days, they'll be dealt with. What happens you now? No, Lassen, I find it very interesting because... No, you have to understand that. I'm trying who, to tell you no, the, the big picture. The, you have to understand no, the, the big, big picture. picture. A lot of people paint this rosy picture of what the CCS was like and how pre-1978 or pre-Republican constitution Basically, Sri Lanka was functioning beautifully, our bureaucrats were, had the highest standards of integrity, our politicians were the greatest. I wasn't around at that time. You know, but the I, more I actually read about I, that time as well, I, it doesn't, the I picture doesn't a, seem very rosy at all. Which I always have it with me, Lord Atkin, Toronto Co Corporation versus York Co Corporation. This was a case decided in 1938, which referred to the three organs of the uh, government, namely the executive, the legislature and the, and the judiciary, as the three pillars in the temple of justice that are not to be undermined. What was meant by this statement was that the three pillars should have equal but independent power to keep each other in check. So unfortunately, even the judiciary can't interfere and take a decision because there is somebody over them, which should not happen. <clears throat> so you have to understand where it has gone wrong. Right. What is important is, in 78, mm. they have brought a system where everything was brought under the president. Mm. Actually, right. this, is the, this is the problem so, so in the so country. I'm getting a lot of questions and I want to uh, try and take them as much as possible. So this question is for Dr. Sara. Uh, since you spoke about political culture, when there are political parties based solely for the purpose of specific communities of the society, how does this help to eradicate corruption? Because people from those segments usually vote for their parties based on the on their needs prioritized, and even the ministers from those parties crossing over after an election just for portfolios to be able to help their community. As long as they cross over, the culture exists to facilitate the majority in the parliament. How can we fight corruption in situations like this? Well, you know, <clears throat> we have to take a decision in Sri Lanka as to whether we are going to be a society that believes that we have unity on the basis of diversity. And if that's the case, then we have to also consider as to whether we will allow political parties and formations to form under religious ground, on religious grounds or on ethnic grounds. But the issue here is this, whether they are 
Singhala, Buddhist, Christian, Tamil, whatever it is, they are citizens of Sri Lanka. Yeah. And if they have the virtues of integrity, of decency, of transparency, of being accountable, if they have a notion of public service, does it matter where they come from? You know, that's the key thing. Is is that we need to have citizens in this country who are of that description that I gave you, or who are striving towards that or approximate that, and we, the rest of us, have to be the ultimate check and balance. Definitely, we have to be the ultimate check and balance. You know, if we go to sleep, I mean, I, I've said this before so many times. You know, every five years we go buy a ticket to a bizarre play, which we call government and governance in this country. Go home and criticize it and all of that, and come back another five years and do the same damn thing. We can't be an audience. We have to be part of the play, as it were. You know, so we have to. You know, we can't sort of just point at politicians and sort of think of them as a different breed. And think of that. You know, they have to come up with a plan to help us and save us. We have to be part of it. So, Dr. Uh, uh, Randi, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm getting a lot of questions. I need to uh, take them as much as possible because uh, uh, the WhatsApp <laughs> messages are loaded with questions. Now, this is this one is for Baranath. Um, Baranath, did a Bolton scam took place in this country in 2015? Absolutely yes. Yeah. In fact, I have mentioned it multiple times for the economic crisis. There were multiple shocks since 2015, and the beginning was the bond scam. And 2016-17, there was the, the, the drought exactly, and same similar things happened. But I think I would I would fly. I have a different view to uh, Mr. Lassil uh, on one point. I think we are missing the bigger picture here, mm. that is on the state capacity, because. you know we had finding it difficult to put like get one minister responsible for one corruption case and it is not practical that we are thinking of getting all the cabinet behind the bars it's like asking turkeys to vote for christmas it is not going to happen that's not practical that's why i say especially in a context where the state capacity is weak and that's one of the main criticisms i have also for the imf recommendations because you have nice recommendations and we all know when we go to state departments mm. their capacity you really do not have the capacity so there's no point again coming back and saying this hasn't been implemented we know they do not have the capacity and so to do that what we need to do is to i go back to my initial point you have to reduce the discretionary power and allow that discretionary power to minimize so then the system basically works and just because trying to strengthen all the it doesn't mean that we should not bring laws we have to but it doesn't by just bringing the laws and without execution this this problem will not go away on the on the other side on the on the uh, on 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 the on the corruption front uh, again on those uh, on on those 1977 and all that i i think definitely the executive president is 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 a bad move mm. but again on the on the current account and all that for business to operate those reforms has to take place i mean look ah. at how many investments how many sri lankan businesses has gone abroad so so, so there was a follow up question to that question as ah, well okay sorry uh, well, sorry i went uh, <laughs> i went slightly so you, <laughs> yeah so you said that um, uh, there was a bond scam in 2015 is it the governor of the central bank who is responsible or the minister then prime minister who was in charge of the central bank of the country i think all three were responsible because the appointment process uh, we all know how it took place so there was a sequence of the appointing process mm -hmm. and then there was a sequence of how that was attempted to cover up uh, so i think all are responsible because if you are trying to cover up uh, one of the scams you are equally responsible mm -hmm. as same as the scam so, so, so i think everyone is every everyone and is well, still, and right. one more now see he, I, i fully agree with danat actually it should definitely be under the minister of finance but it was shifted the minister of economic planning economic, economic and planning mm -hmm. right so you can't do all that mm, to suit your individual no, but whatever the problem is you know? now, now the the now the governor is usually appointed by the president now maithri policy recently went on to say that 
he told Ranil Vikramasinghe not to appoint Arjun Mahendra. Arjun Mahendra was appointed by Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe. No, no because when he, I, I when know he washed his hands. No, there was a long delay. Like you know, it, there was a little delay in making the appointment, right? I mean, it's on record to say you can't, you can't, it's not an excuse, right? I mean, if, if, he, if he were the right president, he would have said, no, I can't, because he's not a, uh, he's a dual citizen, right? But ultimately... He was not the right president. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I would say, right? Now, my so removal... We, we, we have made so many mistakes to Nasir. Now, 2015, help. Maitri Pala citizen was appointed. That's a mistake. 2019, Gota Rajapaksa was You appointed. know this then again... Then you said, we were, I, was, I wanted to wait and see what he does. Please no, 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 because we have and to respect. Was also investigating. We Manitra have to. We have to respect the people. Now, who are you supporting, Nasir? No, we are supporting mm. a new move because we are sick of all these 225, and we have understood that they have failed and they have ultimately bankrupted the whole country. So, what right? is your alternative? You have always had a political yeah. uh, ideology in front of you, know, Nasir. Yeah, actually, in 2015 we you had have, Maitri Palasir. Say in 2019 you had Maitri. You know, like, uh, 2024. Who do you have? Tell me. 2024, we would like to have a have our own program. We will be de definitely. So, you guys, there is a program called uh, Driving Systemic Change, Essential Role, and the yeah. Roadmap for a Five Pillar Governance Framework. S yes. Why do I get the feeling that yeah. this is also just limited to uh, limited to 23 pages? No. Now you will have to go through and then understand what it is. I've gone have through this. That's what I'm asking right. you. Now even this all seems said, like that. Uh, now Dhananath said, you know, there is a system how you govern the country, mm. right? Basically, we will say the our board of directors, if it's a company, right? Our board of directors is the cabinet of ministers, right? And it's a collective responsibility based on the Westminster system. Everybody should take the responsibility because you can't simply allow or approve a proposal just because a member, a minister wants it, right? They have to take the entire responsibility if in case, if it was faulty. So naturally, most of the decisions that they have taken over the years are wrong. That's why we have ultimately ended up having, you know, ultimately can't so end, end up. In this, in this, in this, um, in this 23-page document, yeah. in your concluding remarks, yeah. you all go on to say, yeah. direct parliamentary oversight is crucial yeah. for maintaining state integrity, yeah. ensuring transparency and promoting good governance. Correct. Am I correct? You're right, yeah. That's from this. Yeah, yeah. Now, when now, you have people like Rohit Abegudumarathar appointed to as the co-op committee chairman, you tell me, how does this work now? Did we do that? Unfortunately, people had people no... People have no, no, but no, this, this, is, is, this is, the is the problem. You have to understand. You, I'm no, sorry. But Mr. Lassen, no, this is the problem, no, right? But you Shamir know, highlights is that you I, can you can lay out Shamir the framework as much as you want. No, but Shamir as long is, as there is the, Shamir the wheel is asking the me, people have elected. I am <laughs> asking you, have the people... I mean, do they have any choice, right, to nominate their candidates who are at least good? Right now, no, we look, at, look, at, look at look at Lalit Mudali. Lal look at Lalit Atulat Mudali in '77. He was the Minister of Trade and Shipping. End of the day, recently Rohit Abegunawardena was the Minister of Shipping. Right, and unfortunately, the capacity. Look at the big problem what you have. I mean, end of the day, what has happened here in your country? Expecting right? that Parliament. To, to play the role of maintaining state integrity, no, we, no, we have, we and have, promoting good government. We, 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 we have, we have. We you are have, talking from your right uh, now. Now, now go to page five. We have given five pillar governance system. Right, we say constitution. We can say the legislature, the executive, judiciary, independent commissions. Because what is for those who are watching this show tonight, what yeah. if they say, yeah, this is also. A waste of money. No, 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 no. I mean, we will definitely explain the whole thing to the people because within the next couple of weeks, right, we want to tell the country our biggest problem, mm. nobody respects the constitution. If you have a constitution, you are supposed to because you have given an oath and you are supposed to follow and uh, respect the constitution, right? It's always followed in the breach. Almost 
mm. every day i would say right so yeah. we are we are recommending the constitution because you know even in other countries we have studied carefully what has really gone wrong even in other countries right whether it is in america mm. i mean it's a flawed democracy now they say right because when they implement their decisions mm. the politicians have i mean manipulated those decisions actually there shouldn't be room left for the politicians to manipulate for that matter so, yeah. even the public office yeah. so so, so sankit uh, just uh, switching to you very quickly uh, can't we have a country centric and specific manifesto instead of a political manifesto moving forward ideally we should but a big problem that we have is that we don't have policy continuity between governments and one of the things that mr de silva was uh, referring to the fact that we have police politicized ministries secretaries of ministries being appointed by the president uh, means that the public service at its very helm is amenable to political interference which makes policy continuity very very different but um, you know taking on from your question a little bit more i want to make this point we all talk about accountability right the entire country is thirsty for blood everyone is looking for people to be held criminally accountable but even if all these people we are talking about through generations are held accountable and put behind bars in an ideal situation would corruption in this country stop it will not it will not because the system itself as dananath is referring to the system itself is geared to corrupt whoever occupies these positions so irrespective we need accountability uh, we are pushing for accountability we are engaging in litigation for example because that is a recourse that civil society has had to advert oh, I, to uh, l- l- let me get this right uh, sangita are you trying to say that even if we get rid of the corrupt politicians from this parliament now corruption will not end in the country it will not that is where what you were referring to systemic change reform needs to take place you so know now, about now, the now, civil society yeah. governance diagnostic yeah, yeah. Uh, the imf's governance diagnostic all of it pushes for so that is what the state has agreed to that's the extent that the country has gone to all of that pushes for reform and that's the imf's governance diagnostic talks about in impl- uh, enacting laws we talk about implementing laws enforcing laws so it's really really important for us to push for the reform agenda parallel to the push for accountability because we shouldn't kid ourselves we shouldn't uh, fall into the trap of thinking that just accountability is going to rid the country of corruption but but, uh, but how does a member of the public bring pressure to bear on an elected person uh, once the election is done and dusted uh because in in sri lanka you cannot walk up to the the door of your member of parliament uh and knock on it you are not going to get in uh so the ideal situation would be that local government representatives mm-hmm. who would be more approachable should be there uh however we don't have local government anymore so what what how in the world is the public supposed to bring this pressure to bear on the elected representatives so anti corruption so we should have the right to recall that's it we have Absolutely. a system here proposed recalling system right there are ways and means actually most of the problems that are there in the country can be resolved there is no two words about it now you say cor- uh, corruption cannot be eliminated now there are countries where they say zero tr- tolerance for corruption right and in this country the corruption is growing it has become a cancer why no action can be taken against the politicians that's what i said right uh, government of the politician by the politicians for the politicians those days it was different government of the people by the people for the people why the separation of powers you know ultimately it was the judiciary which decided on whatever irregularities punished so what we want here is the system when you want the system right how do you put the system so, Sarah, so now based on what sankita is saying that even though we get rid of the current 225 members of parliament whoever is going to be appointed will also be corrupt it's quite dangerous that's an alarming situation 
No, so that is why I say you have to do the institutional reform. Yeah. And you also have to do the political culture reform. And you have to look at the interplay, the dynamics between the two. Hopefully, out of that will come a less corrupt system. I don't think we can have a totally non-corrupt system, mm -hmm. but it can be mitigated to a considerable extent. And some of the things that we have talked about, I think are absolutely necessary. But it's not one or the other. The two have to go hand in hand. So, Dr. Sarah, now we see politicians uh, speaking um, about uh, uh, establishing a corruption-free country. We see such slogans being made by the NPP a lot in political fora as well as we speak. What is the alternative for the country at this very moment of time? We see uh, the SL, uh, uh, SLFP uh, uh, having uh, agendas with regard to elections. We see uh, the NPP, SJB, the UNP, uh, SLPP having agendas in terms of the elections. What is your alternative that the people should look at when going to the polling booth this time around? The conventional wisdom is at the present moment is that people are going to vote for a change. That they have given the two main parties power for the last 76 years. They've screwed the country up. We must go for a change. When you ask them what that change is, they're not looking at it. It's an act of desperation. Mm. So what I say is this, is, is that please consider what you are going to vote for. And the recent developments with regard to this television debate between the SJB leader and the NPP leader on what they would do when in government, I think is entirely to be welcomed. And I hope MTV might take it up because people need to know what they are going to do. I mean, the NPP talks about anti-corruption. They haven't told us how they are going to get the money allegedly salted abroad. Right? They say they will probably then go after the money that is in Sri Lanka. But they are telling people that they will do anti-corruption. Once they come into office, if they don't act, their own supporters are going to turn around and sort of say, you're just like all the others. You know, so we need to know what are these plans. But we, we move beyond the slogans. But, but, but we see slogans being made. But when we speak to individuals, now we had uh, last week an NPP representative and we asked him, uh, tell us how do you all intend to uh, bring about uh, change in the country's economy? What sort of conditions would you all discuss with the IMF? They don't have an answer. If you ask the SJB, they would say, uh, we will renegotiate the terms with the IMF. How is it going to be done? No answer. So then the people have to ask themselves the question, one people, one lot doesn't have an answer, the other lot is the same, they also don't have an answer. So, who do so we vote for? the alternative, Dr. Sarah? The alternative is that you don't vote on the basis of faith, that you put pressure and hopefully you all will come up and take this whole idea of the television debate. Get it going. Yeah. Get the people more informed. The basic choice, the basic mechanism of choice and change in a formal democracy is elections. The electors need to be informed. And it is part and parcel of the fourth estate's Media. duty and responsibility to inform them. And to inform them not with regard to fake speech or fake news or, or AI or whatever it is, but with regard to the certain principles of transparency and accountability that the media also has to adhere to. I mean, like for example, there was a media report that said that, look, uh, someone has been already arrested on the OSA. That damn thing, the machinery hasn't been set up. The other day they said that the president has said that there will be no elections until the IMF program is completed. Misreporting. Yeah. Misreporting. Yeah, Misreporting. I mean... And so now everyone is saying, yes, are we going to have presidential elections? They are going to be abolished or they are going to be got rid of. Both instances we have a that you that, refer to that came from the same publication. Adhere to Supreme Court rulings. All of that kind of thing. Why the hell didn't they read their article properly? But... You gave them the headline. We are a nation of headline readers and we're getting misinformed. So yesterday Tananath in Parliament, we saw the passage of the Banking Amendment um, Bill. Uh, 
it went without any contention. Uh, there was no debate. Uh, parliamentarians who were, so, who were supposed to debate uh, these matters yeah. in parliament were not present. People don't know what this, what the contents of the bill is. What is going on in Banana? And that's where, again, I come back to my same point. Uh, of course, our, I mean, if, if, even if the, at the parliament the capacity is not there, even the members are not interested to come and have the debate. 25 parliamentarians Absolutely. are not uh, present. Absolutely. So, so you can imagine what happens afterwards. So that's where it is, I think, what, uh, where we have to come together. That's where I think the pressure needs to mount up in a gradual phase or like in, in different phases, in different fronts. Because that's the only thing, Shamir, that's going to change. Because when we question, when we bring the pressure, is only at least that, that inch of incremental change would happen. Because otherwise, even what we see today but will can not we happen. Have, but can we have any hope in this 225? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. We definitely need new people, but it has to come through the democratic system. There has to be the elections. It has to be similar kind of people. Uh, what kind of people do you think, Dhananath, Sri Lanka requires at this point of time? Because when we speak to people uh, who have the knowledge, who have the capacity, they don't want to contest elections. They don't want to be even from the national list of a of a political no, no, party. Can I can I just drawing on what Dr. Sara said? I'll rephrase that question that Shami was asking. Dr. Sara was saying, you know, we need to have like amongst the public as well. We need to be voting for these values of transparency, look for integrity, people who are willing to be held accountable, etc. Do you feel that maybe as electors we don't uh, elect people with those values because in our day-to-day -day interaction, in our day-to-day -day businesses, we don't uphold those values. So the culture is not there amongst the polity, therefore you cannot expect it amongst the politicians. No, absolutely. I think this, uh, there was a recent piece by the former governor of the uh, Indian uh, Reserve Bank, uh, Raghuram Rajan, Rajan, and he basically has explained why this happens. Uh, and definitely there's a, there's a culture issue because we all, in a way, have been beneficiaries. I think he, he, he said something when, when, back when he was IMF chief economist, if I'm not mistaken, he said something similar uh, regarding the cause of the 2008 financial crisis as well, right? That there was a cultural problem. Yes. Belying what Under, caused yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so I think financial all, crisis. yeah, we all have been. I mean, many people who elect those politicians have been beneficiaries of these systems, and that's where the digitization and that removing that discretionary power comes to. <coughs> so this is where I become play. kind of a, a nihilist, right? I'm, uh, I oscillate between being optimistic and be, being just absolute nihilist. So when I think about it in this in in this case, like okay. Like, okay, if we think about values and if we can get people to care about values and vote for values, then we can have good people in parliament. But then I think we don't uphold these values ourselves in our day-to-day -day lives, so therefore we are not going to have good people in parliament. No, yeah. how do we, critical how, mass. How do we yeah. basically have a critical mass in parliament that uphold those values. You won't get everyone upholding the mm. values, of course not. And also, uh, so also uh, uh, Nadim, I would look at the framework mainly in, in, in voting, answering Shamir's question, because I don't think no one mm. is bigger than the game, because you basically have to, because if we think that one magical person or that magical 225 will come and rescue, it won't happen. It is the framework, it is the, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a guideline it's the System. agreement, it, it is what's going to rescue us. Not one individual, not mm. those 225. It is what we weave together. So that framework is I'm concerned at and that framework would only be the solution for us. No, no, no individual person, no uh, a group, not a political party, nothing. It will be only be that system and that framework. And I think we have to feed into that system to for making sure that the filtering and that voting system takes place in favor of protecting the system. So, uh, as I said before, I'm getting a lot of questions. I'm trying to um, select them very wisely <laughs> because most of them have um, comments and um, references as well. So, uh, referring to Sankita's statement about um, not having a corruption-free country ever, how about we bring some stringent laws for serious crimes like chopping off hands for stealing, like in Islamic law? 
would that stop corruption taking place in the country? <coughs> can, I, can, can I just I, say I, I that hasn't stopped corruption in countries that practice Sharia law anyway? No, but <laughs> I don't think we're advocating <laughs> among that. the most no, corrupt. No, but, 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 Nadim has answered the question. To yeah. You. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. So go ahead, please. Yeah. 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 Just uh, quickly to respond. Um, more rules would help in a rule-following country. We are not a rule-following country. We have a new anti-corruption act. We've had a bribery act. We've had a commission to investigate allegations of bribery or corruption act. We have a penal code which uh, you know recognizes bribery and corruption as offenses. We've had all of this. So more law is not what we need. What we need is serious attention to the issues of today. So that means ensuring that the polity is informed. That means voting correctly. That means getting the systems in place. That means reducing discretion mm. in every, at every single juncture. But as Dhananath was saying, it has to be weaved together because we can't uh, lay the blame or the responsibility for the issue of corruption with any one party. If you look at the anti-corruption infrastructure, each one of us and each sector has a role to play in defending against corruption. Investigative journalists, civil society, citizens, COPE, COPA, the Auditor General, Parliament, right. the Judiciary. I can go on, the Central Bank, the FIU, the uh, private banks, <coughs> the public banks. All of them have a role to play the and courts. systems, uh, the courts. Uh, I think I mentioned the Judiciary. Uh, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't get solved in one sweep of a wand. So we have to keep pushing for all of this. And in terms of the tools that we need to be in place, we need beneficial ownership registers that show any conflicts of interest, who really owns companies. We need asset declarations to be public so that voters can be informed before uh, they vote. We need campaign finance laws, but we need campaign financing information being put out in public by the people receiving it and by the people giving campaign financing, like companies, like individuals. All of this, you, uh, one of your um, uh, re uh, viewers had mentioned that we don't have a system that uh, can be integrated, but we have that in law now. So pushing for that, all of that has to happen. So the problem and, is and that we have laws in the country. Now let's talk about the exactly what I was act saying. that was, yes. uh, that was enacted, enacted recent, recently. Three, uh, but the implementation is key is the at the end of the day, isn't yeah. it? Absolutely agree. And that's why this kind of victory is hard fought. It has been years that we have fought for the public access to asset declarations. We have it in law now. The next fight is to ensure that SEABOC is resourced, to ensure that the appointments to SEABOC, the Director General, the Commission appointments are done properly, that we have visionary now leadership. Recently, now recently, we saw all the issue of like to SEABOC to being resourced now as well. Now yeah. at number <coughs> you know, 2023 is the one that was recommended by the IMF. Even to date, Right now, see about these big Ghanians and all that. Right, such a lot of corruption taking place. Nothing will will be stopped in the system. But I am trying to say, it reminded me during the course of the discussion. You know, in 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 Canada, maybe they have gone through the same problem. Look at our country. How many reports have been tabled in Parliament with regard to various omissions and commissions, all that? Right, none of those have been actioned. Nobody now, even uh, but central bank. We are expecting those to be actioned by the very people. No, 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 no. Now, see, when the parliament submits <coughs> a report to uh, parliament, now the committee investigated and tabled it in parliament. Actually, the parliament is supposed to send it to the attorney general and for him to take it up with the court, I mean, send it to the judiciary and do the needful. But that has never happened for the last 30, 40 years. I have been in parliament for 37 years. And I know after the 70s, nothing has been done. Most of those things under under now, the now, big... Now, 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 bless him. The COPE committee yeah. has been established in the country in the late 1970s. Correct. Yes. Tell me one instance. That's what I one, said. One instance. That's what I said. Now, see, so look at the look at the taken. PAC. It was it's a drama. You no, PC. No, 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 no. What I'm trying to say. Yeah. Coming and yeah. Testifying all that very good. True. Well, and now let me say. But what now, see, in, in Canada, what did they do? They appointed a commission, right? A public accounts commission. That's about the all this. They are the ones who are taking legal action thereafter. So in our case also, we have to have something similar. We have to have follow various other countries also. 
and try and see whether they could be planted here and push the, the, these things through. So what I am trying to tell you, we have to understand what governance is, how you promote or how you stabilize the whole system effectively, you know, deliver all that for the benefit of the people. Here, nothing happens. Ultimately, you don't know. You now ask you spoke me. About, now you spoke about sh uh, sprats uh, being caught and the sharks evading yeah, the net. Yeah. Uh, recently, we saw a police sergeant sentenced to four years for accepting a bribe of 500 rupees. Yeah. But we don't hear stories of individuals who have swindled money, You're who right. have accepted bribes in millions. In my uh, case, I don't know whether this is correct, right? Can a, can, a, can a public officer or can a man who was charged for murder, uh, extortionist, be in parliament? So when those things happen, anything can happen in Sri Lanka. Let me say it that way, without naming. You know? I think he's since been acquitted, right? No, acquitted. Thing. That again, you know. Let's stop it. <laughs> well, right. Stop. Stop appeals. No, I mean, you know, he was once convicted for murder and sentenced to jail. Yeah. Right. And then he was released on bail on appeal. I think better leave leave it to the people to decide. Right. So basically, my thinking is, if no, that I mean, is the yeah, kind of governance it's, it's system the, it's that the judges is there in and the court country, that must decide, you will yes. never be able to They've serve decided. the masses the way we think. Mm -hmm. Right? This right. needs to be so, corrected. So this needs to be turned upside down, probably. Uh, right? And they will never do that. So, uh, Dr. Sarah, uh, I have another question from uh, one of our viewers. Um, can Sri Lanka turn into a Swiss style cabinet and rotating presidency? No single party gets control of the cabinet. Very good. That's possible. That's a system Sarah, change if that is the case. If I had your telephone, I would send her or him the reply of what is it that you are willing to do to make sure that that happens? Yeah. Do you think that the, uh, that the people in the parliament will ever do that? But, but Dhananath said, Dr. Sarah, this time around an election, we won't be looking at political parties per se. We'll be looking at individuals who can make a change, who will so bring in that, bring in that difference to the table. Mm -hmm. uh, don't you think this time around, at a general election in particular, well, it's I'm going to be individual-centric rather than political party-centric? Well, we've had the argument that we all have to work together on a reform agenda and that we can't expect a single individual that we've gone now beyond the point of hoping for messiahs so in effect we have to be the change that we want to be definitely you're right and it is us who have to come up with a reform agenda with arguments for constitutional reform and make sure that they are done i mean look the Aragale, apart from anything else, people took power into their own hands. Maybe they didn't have a specific plan and all of that, but they did take power into their own hands. They stood their ground. They had at least a limited objective that they achieved. It can happen again. It can happen again. Yeah. And hopefully it will happen better planned. And if it was a reasonably a good government, right, they won't, you know, like what happened there, they won't allow that to sort of drag. It is a gentlemanly set of people we need in governance because, uh, you know, sorry, yes. uh, I'll come back to you. Uh, please, please. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, yes. No, so you're, you're saying, yeah. they have to have a proper plan mm. to be implemented. They have to have a political program. And that is what the citizens of this country perhaps have to come around in the next election. And that is why I say we need to have a set of constitutional reform proposals, a set of economic reform proposals, and get the political parties to endorse those things in full or part and hold them to it. Do you have any hope on these politicians, um, Dr. Sarab? I live in hope. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, I won't be sitting. So, definitely. Just on that, just case, one, one, more, one, more, one more question for, for Sankita, actually. Sankita, you were talking earlier about uh, you know, the need to uh, ensure that institutions like Siabok are well resourced, that you have the right people being appointed there, that, you know, there is, it's a multi-pronged sort of approach. When I look at it, it, it sort of appears to me like this Gordian knot 
you're not sure where to start because even when you're talking in terms of resources, uh, Seabock has been underspending its budget mm. for many, many years by big amounts. Uh, so there's, there's no, it seems that, okay, on the one part, there's a lack of will. So then maybe we fix it with your solution of getting the right people in. But getting the right people in involves getting the right people, the appointers, getting the right people in the parliament, into the constitutional council, etc. And then it seems to just go full circle, you know, like the snake eating its <coughs> own tail. I agree. <coughs> so when I look at this Gordian knot, eh, where do you start? Yeah. Or maybe what you do need at the end of the day is, is what many people ask for is someone with a sword to come and smash it. No, exactly. Can I, yeah. can I add yeah. to the Gordian knot that you're referring to? Uh, one of the issues that Seabok has said is a problem that they have um, is that people don't come to them with evidence. Whistleblowers don't come to them, witnesses don't come to them. Therefore, they have difficulty prosecuting these large-scale corruption cases. And I'm no apologist for Seabok. Um, but because of that, they are stuck in this situation of by their account, not being able to prosecute. I can think but of many examples no, where people have gone with the evidence job? where there hasn't been it prosecution. Is but isn't that and the job of Seabok? Yeah, to investigate right. and well, find the I evidence. Mean, the, the public I agree. are not detectives. Yeah. Uh, they can't be uh, going behind I and agree. collecting all this I, evidence. I agree, but I'm talking about witnesses. To play the role of Sherlock Holmes. I'm also talking about witnesses being able to participate in a court process. Hmm. So part of evidence, part of investigation is producing witnesses before court. Right? So witnesses need to be able to stand up in court and attest to certain facts. However, how can we also accept citizens to come forward and be witnesses in a system that is captured in a system where they're not seeing they're progress? Not protected. Mm. They're not protected and they're not seeing progress. So because Seabok doesn't prosecute, people don't come to Seabok. People don't come to Seabok because people don't, uh, because Seabok doesn't prosecute. So I think an immediate short term solution to this, and this is to Seabok, is to start communicating when they do do something which is rare, few and far between, but they need to, uh, need to start communicating better. They need to start also exercising their independence to the extent that is provided by law. We know in 2015, the Constitutional Amendment, the 19th Amendment, afforded Seabok a new power to be able to carry out investigations of their own volition without making for, waiting for a complaint to be made. In 2017, upon the RTI Act becoming operationalized, TISL requested information on how many times that power had been exercised and there was an unashamed response of zero. We have this on document, it is on our website. So, Seabock now with the new law has been given, I think it's section 55 to 59 of the Anti-Corruption Act uh, in, of September 2023, has given them new powers, powers of surveillance, powers, you know, to all kinds of powers, observation. So Seabock needs to start showing that they're using these things. We saw a recent account of a private sector employee being arrested for an instance of sexual bribery. Even that little bit has the possibility of changing public perception, Absolutely. leading to ideally, um, you know, witnesses, victims coming yeah. forward. <coughs> I'm talking about a short term and small immediate mm. solution because we can't keep speaking but, but constantly. Uh, uh, you know, when people in this country have any problems, they don't go to Seawalk, they go to their local police station. Seawalk is almost non-existent to most people in this country. Absolutely. I don't, I don't think even the people know where the location of Seawalk is. Absolutely. Is and the place. best way for Seawalk to communicate its existence is to start taking action, not to go around. And I know Seawalk is engaged in a prevention drive. But Seabok going and talking to people about preventing corruption or how citizens should stand up a is, is a waste of money waste and a waste money. of time in right. this so, context. So, so and yeah. it's mm. it, it, out of touch with the appetite, appetite and the need of the moment. Uh, so, but Dharanath, you spoke about um, electing uh, people um, and there will be an agenda that will come into play. Uh, the question is, majority of voters are from rural areas. Can they decide? Who are the educated or best to be elected? It's uh, it's a difficult question to answer, to be honest, because the reality is, because of this cultural issue, they have been the beneficiaries of the politicians. So basically, they would more 
Uh, towards exactly towards them. inclining towards the political uh, you know who are the Party. political masters but it doesn't mean we should also not undermine that the grassroots are you know fairly. not exa- they are fairly sharp yeah. because they understand what is happening and uh, but of course there are instances that they, they also go with the go with the wave or the tide but i think we should not underestimate uh, also on their uh, information oh, see, for an example dananath there was a parliamentarian who threw chilies in parliament he was re-elected to parliament again he's not rural he's urban yeah, he's urban but he was re-elected to parliament again by the i people. mean a, l- a lot of a no, lot of the miscreants you're referring to actually from urban now centers see, in this country they are doling out various things right the poverty is so bad whatever said and done it is public money they are using in that way so what is needed now up to 1970s you know schools they had a lot better facilities now there are vacancies for english teachers maths teachers right all that and they have reduced their educational whatever co- allocation so in a situation like that definitely it's going to be a big problem because our politicians for that matter if we follow the westminster system we have to appoint people who can do that job at least as legislators now see <laughs> there are people who don't understand what mm. legislation is actually the blame should go to the party leaders whether it is mind the rajapaksha whether it is ranil wickremesinghe all of them right they are the people accordingly destroyed even parliament for that matter right yeah uh, dr sorry no i mean you know no, this whole question of whether the rural people will understand mm. i mean two things you know in india during the emergency there was an election and mrs gandhi was turfed out the vast bulk of the indian electorate would have been seen as illiterate or semi literate they wouldn't have got degrees and if you look at the people who've got degrees they're exactly the people who we say have screwed us up in style the second point with regard to it is is that you know at uh, cpa at the center for policy alternatives we've done some surveys on the level of awareness of what the imf program is all about and the figures for the rural areas are surprising they are not at all ignorant mm. yeah they're not ignorant not any more Mm. Chris, I just given your extensive sort of work over the years in this area let me uh, try and frame that question if i could do you feel that there's a culture almost patronizing culture amongst specifically colombo elites when it comes to how we perceive so called rural voters as either illiterate or uneducated absolutely and that, that is, is one of the reasons why because if you actually look at uh take post uh, 2018 constitutional coup time a lot of the miscreants in parliament for example they weren't sent there by rural voters they were from uh, urban centers yeah. right there is a culture of patronage yeah which is reinforced by the culture of entitlement and the two have given us this crisis of governance that were deeply mired in at the present moment. Mm. So there's a final question uh, um, that I'm going to take uh, from our viewers and also the two journalists. Um, referring to Lassil, why doesn't the constitution specifically cite limitations on the basic qualifications to be considered when electing parliamentarians, like not having a criminal record, etc.? Isn't this a flaw in the constitution? Yeah, constitution. actually, uh, you know, now even in the history, like, Ma, ma you know there are people trade union leaders who have been ultimately elected to parliament right so particularly in that sense they may not have shut the doors for them that's one reason other reason of course very correct if they were murderers if they were people who have definitely been criminals right they should be completely shut so these things need to be done there is no two words about it but unfortunately this is why we say but new but right, 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 it's there in the law it's clear right. no so the that's why we need reforms that's right. why we need to change uh, right. but so, if you so are a convicted killer a murderer whatever it is you can't you can't become a member of become a member of parliament but there but, are individuals with with uh, yes, integrity you, being questioned but if you are a convicted criminal that issue arises in the united states of america with regard to donald right. trump hmm. right uh, so let's um, let's wrap up Uh, for the day but before that let's uh, hear uh, the final thoughts of our panelists tonight uh, so let's start start off with uh, Danath Fernandez CEO of Educala Institute what is your message to the public 
this being an election near Dharanath, uh, people have to make decisive decisions right now. Crucial juncture, the country's economy is facing. What do we do now? We have to believe on the program and there are key reforms that needs to be done on economic revival as well as on anti-corruption. Uh, State-owned enterprises reforms is mandatory. Also the trade reforms are mandatory. Also the reforms at the Sri Lanka customs are, is mandatory. Without those three, that also incentivizes there's one side is corruption, the other side is economic growth. That framework is what we need to consider. Not any individual can rescue us. It's only the program and the process will take us out from this crisis. There is no other way out and we have to trust that system. Thank you very much, Danath Fernando, CEO of Advocate Institute. Uh, I now pay attention towards uh, Lassil De Silva, former Director of Administration Parliament. What's your final thoughts, uh, Lassil? Uh, actually, our country was on a very strong footing because it was education, health, all that. You know, in the early 30s, early 40s, we had a lot of problems, malnutrition, all that, right? All that was overcome. We were on the right track. Even after ending the war, our leaders were not in a position to understand how to settle those other issues that were their reconciliation, maybe all that, right? Look at the biggest problem, debt. Why did we get into debt? Bad management. There was a law in 2003, fiscal management, right? Totally abused. When they wanted, they amended, re-amended, did all that. We ended up in bankruptcy. All what I say, you know, there is a, there is a uh, odious debt there is a World Bank decision. If the people have not benefited, right, such that should be recovered from them. I don't know how we do that, but we have to work hard for it. We can't take the blame and we can't take the burden. That's about it. Let the society also think on the, those lines, you know. Thank you very much, Rasel uh, Silva. I now move my attention towards uh, Sankita Gunratna, Deputy Executive Director of Transparency International Sri Lanka. I think it's a reiteration of what has been said so far um, and a call to the people to not lose hope because we saw protests happening on the streets in 2022 but now that protest has to move into the more formal spaces because we don't have the luxury honestly of protesting every day people have livelihoods mm. people have to make ends meet this is a very difficult dire economic situation that we're living in but that call that was made by people as dr sarah was referring to needs to now be crystal crystallized into actual forms of reform and i think all the panelists here have come up with specific reforms that are needed and then we need to um, solve the problem of corruption we need to address it and in order to do that i think if we had to make a choice of whether we start at the top or start at the bottom we have to vote correctly so that it can start at the top right so that is also important and then we as citizens as nadim was referring to if we ourselves are part of the problem of corruption we need to stop that now we need to remove ourselves from being part of the problem and make corruption untenable at every juncture so we have seen now the courts almost proving to be a battleground on any critical issue on any critical issue we are seeing people go to court challenge it so litigation is something citizens can engage in and it can be any public spirited indi individual that can go to court we saw this on the online safety act i really um, took courage from the fact that people who were on the streets during the Aragalia went to court moving their protest to the formal, pro, uh, formal spaces by petitioning the Supreme Court by way of a bill challenge when that bill was tabled in, uh, placed in, on the order paper of parliament. So not giving up hope and making corruption untenable at every juncture, whether it is on a specific in, uh, instance of corruption or with, when it comes to the polling booth, I think is what the citizens need to do and all of us need to do. Thank you very much, Sankita. Uh, I now move my attention towards Dr. Parker Sarvan Muthu, Executive Director of the Center for Policy Alternatives. I think there are two things that we have to consider here. One, I would say, is that there is no such thing as a free lunch. We have to recognize our responsibilities and when we're voting, we really need to recognize what we're voting for and make sure that even if it's an act of desperation, it's an informed act of desperation. 
The second one is, is that there's no such thing as a quick fix. None of these things are going to happen overnight. Mm -hmm. But we must vote in a way that it puts us on the course of correction. Because quite frankly, I think we've, we've lost 10 years already. If we come back to where we would have been 10 years ago, we still have 10 years more to catch up with. So we're talking about a situation of roughly 20 years to get out of it. Roughly 20 years to get out of it. And therefore we are voting in an election which is decisive, not just in terms of the immediate circumstances, but in terms of the circumstances over the next decade as well. Because we've got a horrendous brain drain. We are talking about in that 10 years time where something like 40% of the jobs are supposed to be AI related. Are we ready for that? No, we are not. <coughs> and those people who've gone out, in 10 years time, their parents will probably pass away and they won't be sending money back. We're an aging population. So we need to think about all of those things. I know it is very difficult for people and they have to act, well, they will act in desperation to alleviate their current circumstances. But we must, civil society, in terms of the organizations that constitute organized civil society, must give them enough information to be able to make informed decisions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Parkeshwar Saranmuthu, Executive Director of the Center of Policy Alternatives, Sankita Gunaratna, Attorney at Law, Deputy Executive Director of Transparency International Sri Lanka, Lassil De Silva, former Director of Administration Parliament as well as former Secretary of Presifac, Dhananath Fernando, CEO of Advocate Institute. Dhananath, I won't let you go yet. <laughs> uh, I would be failing in my duty if I don't ask you about the country's um, economy. Uh, tell us in a nutshell, um, how do you view the country's economy at present? Temporary stability is what we experience. It's not a permanent, uh, a permanent uh, situation. Uh, without the reforms, uh, we, are, uh, we are climbing on a very delicate line. Uh, a second uh, 18th IMF program or a second debt restructuring is just around the corner if we do not do the necessary reforms because we have to look at the debt restructuring also with economic growth because your debt is being measured compared to your growth. So if you do not have the economic growth, definitely we are going for another debt restructuring. That would be a very difficult situation as Dr. Sara said. The first uh, debt restructuring, basically we lost 10 years. So I need not to say what would happen in the second debt restructuring. So I, I try to say that not very quickly that all this what we are witnessing right now is because there will be an election in the future and everything is being manipulated by the government in power. I am not saying everything is being manipulated. There are positive signs at the same time. The economy is pretty much stabilizing but this stabilization you cannot stay in the stabilization for a long time. It is like when you enter a job you come for a salary but you cannot stay in that salary till you retire. Uh, basically you have to gradually move up because stability that stability frame that you cannot stay for a long time that's why we need to shift the gears for for growth uh, at the same time there are manipulations also taking place for the election but i'm not saying all the changes that we are seeing is because of our manipulation the defin economy is definitely stabilizing mm -hmm. but i wanted to reiterate and highlight that the growth needs to coming in that can only come with reforms including what we discussed today but of course there are more reforms are there that need to take place outside uh, the anti-corruption space but corruption and governance is key but at the same time to growth there are multiple other reforms that we need to do. One more question uh, Naranath, I'm going to let you go for sure this time. Um, I know you don't, you, don't, you, you don't have a crystal ball in front of you but tell us uh, the rupee against the US dollar where, where do you see it by the end of the month? End of the month, very difficult to predict, to be honest, but uh, with the uh, Expo Lanka transaction, if th the money flows in, the dollars flows in, there is likely that the rupee will appreciate again. But with the interest rates going again down and with people's, uh, people's uh, consumption uh, picking up, likely that there will be uh, some level of depreciation at the same time in the long run. But in the short run, because people have burdened with 
taxes and people are not spending the construction has basically uh, uh, declined by about 50% it's slowly picking up so till then i think i do i do not see if the tourism and the remittances are flowing as it, as usual i do not see a reason why the rupee should depreciate uh, but uh, at the, at the moment i think uh, the central bank it also depends on what the central bank is going to do because they are also buying uh, dollars from the market and building their reserves so that right. will uh, also cause uh, the exchange rate uh, in the coming few months thank you very much dhananath uh, fernandez ceo of atikara institute thank you very much nirishali tambi consultant and director at news first thank you very much nadim majid um thank you very much for those who sent in those pertinent questions i'm very sorry if i didn't take most of them uh that's because of time constraints and um i had to take uh, the best questions to the panelists uh because we were picking their brains on our subject tonight uh, which is anti corruption and the need for systemic change in sri lanka i leave you tonight with the quote as i always do uh, corruption is the enemy of development and of good governance it must be got rid of both the government and the people at large must come together to achieve this national objective take care and good night